Disclaimer. We are interested in everything and experts in nothing. We enjoy learning, but get it wrong sometimes. We mean no disrespect, and if we mess up, kindly correct us. Let's take this ride together, unless your intention is to cause harm or distress. In which case, with utmost haste, fuck right off. I'm Sarah. I'm Roxana. And it's Roxana's turn. It is my turn. Uh, So in honor of the beginning of the Burr months, meaning September, October, November, December, um, I'm going to cover the Witch of King's Cross. I know nothing about this. Okay. Uh, Sounds spooky, right? Kind of. Not even a little bit. Um, Unless you consider it terrifying that you've never heard of her before, which is how I felt. So who is this self-proclaimed witch of King's Cross? She is a badass bitch by the name of Rosaline Norton. I know nothing about this. Okay. Yes. I knew nothing about it either until um, this weekend we stumbled upon a documentary on a documentary on Amazon and it was called the witch of king's cross and like the summary of it i was like oh wait a minute we're watching this and you'll see why as i get into it okay let's so, go rosaline norton and her friends called her Rowie. so there'll be many times that i'll call her roey um, but her full name was rosaline miriam norton she's okay. from australia so if you think of it as Rowie, you can hear it in an australian accent i know the face i get it but yeah, I don't like it, but that's okay. I don't have to. Continue. Okay. Um, so Rosaline Miriam Norton was born on October 2nd in 1917. Um, she used the name of Thorn as her professional name, but that didn't really stick on very often. She was more known by her actual name. Okay. Um, she was a New Zealand-born Australian artist and occultist. Hmm. Yes. And in the latter capacity, adhering to a form of pantheistic or neo-pagan witchcraft, largely devoted to the mythological Greek god Pan. Okay. She had an obsession with Pan. Wait, what was Pan the god of? Mostly he was a, he was a satyr, so he was half man, half goat. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what he was actually the god of. All that's coming to mind is like, pan pipes like he's a flautist yes. or something well that's what he played a lot okay. of times they were mischievous they were i think they were followers or something of bacchus because they're known to be debaucherous and stuff of like that um oh he was also a fertility god uh the sense. god of wild shepherds and flocks uh-huh. rustic music there's the pan pipes there's the pan pipes and impromptus the companion of the nymphs what's like what like impromptu gatherings what does that mean i don't know what that means but it's also a fertility god and yes companion of the nymphs there's always things where they're That's being where chased and, yeah um so she lived much of her later life in the bohemian area of king's cross sydney in sydney australia so that was leading to her be- being termed the witch of king's cross in some of the tabloids and she also did lead her own coven of witches. Okay, so why was she a badass bitch besides just being a badass bitch? Right. She was an artist and her paintings, fabulous. I swear, really? they, they are the coolest things. Um, so they have been compared to those of British occult artist Austin Osman Spare, which I don't know him, but... Um, He often depicted images of supernatural entities such as pagan gods and demons, sometimes involved in sexual acts. That Um, checks out. Yeah. These caused particular controversy in Australia during the 1940s and 50s when the country was both socially and politically conservative. (laughs) That also checks out. (laughs) Yep. With Christianity as the dominant faith at the time. And the government of Australia promoted a harsh stance on censorship. So they weren't having shit. Um, The authorities dealt with her work harshly, with the police removing some of her work from exhibitions, confiscating books, 
that contained her images and attempting to prosecute her for public obscenity on a number of occasions. Whoa. Right. And then they didn't just take her paintings. They destroyed them. They literally destroyed her paintings saying that they were obscene and therefore needed to be destroyed, which I'm like, bitch, but moving on. Um, So according to her later biographer, Neville Drury, Norton's esoteric beliefs, cosmology, and visionary art are closely intertwined and reflect her unique approach to the magical universe. Uh, She was inspired by the night side of magic, so Mm. emphasizing darkness, um, studying the Kilfoth. Um, I didn't say it right, but it is apparently a part of the, you know, the mystical Jewish Kabbalah that all the megastars in the early odds were obsessed with. Like we see you, Madonna, obsessed with Kabbalah. But oh, it's basically like in her frozen era. Yes. Frozen gotcha, gotcha. Kabbalah Madonna. Okay. Yes. So um, so it's the mystical books in the Jewish Kabbalah, which I've never read, but mm-hmm. still pretty cool. Um, alongside forms of sex magic, which she had <laughs> learned from the writings of English occultist Alistair Crowley. Oh, duh. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Anything that you're going to call sex magic is just going to make anybody who's going to be like censorship. They're going to be like, absolutely fucking not. Of course, you're going to piss them off with sex magic because they've never had sex good enough to qualify as magic. And they're fucking jealous. Yeah, they are. Anything that's beyond the missionary in order to make children, they're out. Okay. That's just, that's not okay. You can't even turn the lights on. That is unacceptable. Yeah. Yeah, and anyway. then you have to feel a good, healthy dose of shame afterwards for being Absolutely. so low that you gave in to your basest whatever. Fuck it. We're we're moving on. Okay, so Norton was born in Dunedin during a thunderstorm at about four thirty in the morning. Um, so she says that she was born magic because she was born during this four thunderstorm, which I'm like, you know what? Sure, I'm fine with it. I know, right? Part of me wants to be like, is that crazy? And the other part of me is like, nah, I'm for it. I'm for it. Well, see, my brother, the day he was baptized, there was an earthquake in Cincinnati. So, I mean, yeah, there was. I mean, obviously, it wasn't a disastrous earthquake. Well, it's Cincinnati, so. It is Cincinnati. We're not exactly on a fault line. But, yes, the day that my brother was baptized, earthquake. The God said, maybe not. (laughs) Maybe not. (laughs) <laughs> like we have a sense of humor we're gonna fuck with your old world catholic polish relatives but anyway hilarious. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so she was born in uh, new zealand originally they immigrated to um, the sydney area later um, she had three sisters the sisters were each over a decade older than her Ooh, age gap yeah. okay so big age gap. Um, she would claim that she had been born a witch because she had certain biological features to mark her out as such. Besides the thunderstorm, yeah, she said that she had pointed ears, blue markings on her ne- on her left knee, and a strand of flesh that hung on her body. What? Uh, I do not know. I saw no pictures of strand of flesh. I don't know what they mean by strand of flesh. Does that, that- mean like you have floppy arms? Because if so. I am a serious witch. I don't know what that means, but I don't it either. gives me the willies. I don't like the sound of it. I don't like the sound of a strand of flesh that no. hangs off your body. No. That, What's that like sounds... the world's worst skin tag? What is that? Oh God. Oh God. No, no, that you need to go to a doctor immediately. Right. Pointed ears. I kind of have a little bit of pointed ears. They're not super like conical shape, but they point up a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what the blue marking on the left knee is, but I've constantly got bruises. So maybe, Um, but the strand of flesh, I'm I'm out. I got nothing. I saw nothing in pictures. I don't know if I'd want to see that. I would not. Um, So no, thank you. No, thank you. Um, Also, as a child, uh, she never liked being conventional. We're going to not be shocked by this. And yeah. disliked most other children as well as authority figures, including her mother, Bina, with whom her relationship was very strained. I don't know why I love that. I love that. I love this woman. Seriously. She was a child saying this. Oh, I mean, you know like, what? The other kids don't like you either. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Okay. So um, her father, Albert, was a sailor and regularly away from home. 
And although he provided enough income so that the Nortons were able to live comfortably, you know, he wasn't around much and she didn't like other children, i.e. her siblings, not that mm-hmm. much. And she really didn't get along with her mom. Wait, 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 but the siblings were like 10 years older than her. Yeah, I guess maybe they only had sex when he came back to court. I really don't know. So no, I, <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. I meant like they're 10 years older than her and she's still too mature for them. Like that's, that's well, I just funny. mean. She also had some other siblings. She also had some younger siblings later on. Oh, okay. Um, but she was in line as a third of three sisters. She was the younger one. But okay. yeah, she's like, no, I don't, I don't have time for children. Um, and she didn't really like her mom or any other authority figure. Wow. Um, so you so, were just born into a family and you hated all of them. Yeah. She later described her life as being generally wearisome period of senseless shibboleths crying adults, detestable or depressing children whom I was supposed to like, and parental reproaches. <gasps> All right, pop off. I love this bitch. I swear to God, this bitch is it. It is just the best. Um, okay. Due to this, she actually kept herself not sleeping in the house. She decided she was not going to sleep in the house. She was going to live in a tent that she pitched in the garden for three years. He's killing me. She did not live in her house. She lived in a tent for three years. That's amazing. Yes. She kept a pet spider at the entrance who she named, I think it might be Horatius. It's H-O-R-A-T-I-U-S. Horatius? Horatius, maybe? I don't know. But he he was at the entrance. She had as other goats, I'm sorry, she had other pets, including cats, lizards, tortoises, toads, dogs, and a goat. There it is. There it is. So I'm just imagining like she's got like her security system is her little spider friend. I was like, what the hell is he supposed to do? I'm like, what alarm system is a spider going to give off? I don't know. But like, I, I'm, I'm flip-flopping back and forth between like imagining how badass and ridiculous this is. But then at the same time, like, from the perspective of the siblings like how fucking weird is your <laughs> sister <laughs> we don't talk to her it's fine she <laughs> finds us senseless and wearisome oh could you imagine being the, the mother to a child like that though how how do you even do that i was like please come in the house take a shower put that spider someplace else I it's just- either like it's either like low-key neglect or like grade a parenting like right? how did you manage i don't to live outside for three years three years three years <laughs> oh, oh man. shit they must have had good weather because good god that too um so she was enrolled in a church of england girls school where she was eventually expelled for being disruptive there and drawing images of demons, vampires, and other beings, which the teachers claimed had a corrupting influence on other pupils. Okay, see, you said a Church of England school, and I'm like, oh, that ain't a fit. That's not gonna nope, work. Nope. nope, it did not. It did not indeed. Because immediately she just started drawing images of demons, vampires, and apparently influenced other pupils. Like this bitch is amazing. Like she is Wednesday Adams personified. She is like the 1950s Wednesday Adams, and I'm here for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and oh, you know, we'll get through this. I swear we will. But I feel like there are a lot of things that someone might choose to say about this woman, but there is no doubt she was not afraid to do her own fucking thing. Oh, exactly. Exactly. She Oof. was completely her own person from birth, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Like Day there one. is no no way in hell she was influenced by anyone other than herself. Yeah, talk about breaking the mold. Absolutely. Oof. Um so following her uh she did attend after she somehow managed through primary school um she got kicked out of the church of england i don't know where she went after that Uh, but she did attend east sydney technical college studying art there was a sculptor by the name of raynar hoff he encouraged her artistic talent and she greatly admired him so he saw the talent that was there instead of this is a weird girl who lives in a tent and plays with spiders he might have said 
that and she's a fantastic <laughs> artist. Right, because both can be true. Yes. Um, so but once she graduated from college, she set herself up to become a professional writer with the newspaper Smith's Weekly. Um, she was publishing a number of her horror stories in 1934. Oh, that fits. Yes. Um, now, this is a little bit weird because it says when she was 16, uh, they gave her a job as a cadet journalist and then an illustrator. But I'm like, is this before or after she went to college? Because I'm not sure what the college age time frame is. I don't know. Maybe it was like, maybe she got like her GED and then went to maybe. college and this is like an internship. I don't know. Yeah. Because I mean, it was a technical college. So and yeah. it might have been more like a vocational school than a actual college. But anyway. Yeah. Um, so she got a job as a cadet journalist and an illustrator. However because we love her. Her graphic illustrations were dream deemed too controversial and she lost her job at the paper. <laughs> yep, absolutely happening. That's so good. Yes, so leaving Smith's Weekly, Norton moved out of her family home following the death of her mother and, start, and uh, sought employment as an artist's model, working for such painters as Norman Lindsay. Um, he was a famous painter. Um, so she's already like, you know what, fuck this. Mom's dead. I have no reason to stay here. I don't know if she was still in the backyard at this point. I'm no. guessing she was. Um, but I, I'm loving all of this. I love how she gives absolutely zero fucks. Zero. Zero, zero fucks. Okay. Um, so now in 1935, Rosaline met a man named Beresford Lionel Conroy, which is just a badass name. It's so long. It is. Um, they married on the 14th of December in 1940. So they met in 1935. They were friends or other, but they officially married in 1940 before going on a hitchhiking trip across Australia from Sydney to Melbourne and then through Brisbane and Cairns. So they went I, all over the place. I keep forgetting how, how long ago this was because this would be pretty outlandish even now. Oh, I know. Because I'm... I, I know because I'm getting the historical context. I know. I was like, uh, hitchhiking? Are you crazy? Yeah. But it was a little bit more common then. Yeah, that. Yeah. Um, once they returned to Sydney, Conroy enlisted as a commando and went off to serve in New Guinea during the Second World War. This I could not find any further clarification on. I saw it on multiple sources with no clarification. So I got nothing. Oh, but here we go. Um, upon his return, Norton who had been forced to live in a stable during this period, demanded a divorce, which was finally settled in 1951. I, I said forced to live in a stable, like a horse stable? Like with a horse? Yeah, I have no idea. He went off to fight in World War II. He comes home. She's living in a stable? During the time that he comes home, she was forced to live in a stable. Again, there was no clarification. I don't know if a stable is a term for like, I don't know, cheap ass housing. I don't know if it was like an actual horse stable. I found no further clarification on the multiple sources that said she had to live in a stable. But either way, he comes home. She demands divorce. They get, they get divorced finally in 1951. But anyway... Okay. Yep. So many questions, but continue. Because well, I had questions because I was like, is that a boarding house? But then the very next sentence is afterwards, Norton took up a residence in a boarding house. So not that. Like, nope. Not that. Uh, known as the Marangaroo in the Rocks area. I just love the name Marangaroo. It's like a Marangaroo. combination of the Marangue and a kangaroo because they're in Australia. I don't know. It was my guess. Yeah. Um, she enjoyed it for its eccentric communal living which that's in quotations. So I have questions. I was like, does this mean just a bunch of strangers living together? It sounds like Outback an Orgies. Artist colony. Yeah, and I was like, it's like an, an, art, an artist orgy or something. I have no idea. She started illustration work for a monthly free thinking magazine known as The Pertinent, which was founded in 1940. Uh, it was edited by a poet named Leon Bat. And Leon Bat admired Norton's work, um, which was being increasingly influenced by pagan themes. 
um, he was describing her as a artist artist worthy of comparison to some of the best continental American and English contemporaries. And I've seen her paintings as far as like when what they showed on the uh, documentary. They're fucking fabulous. Yes, they are pagan as fuck, but they are so fabulous. Like the just the colors and the I love it. You'll see them. I, I have a cop a bunch that I copied over. Good. Um, so she contributed a poem and cover illustration uh, for Bratz, I'm sorry, Bats Anthology, Not for Fools, a collection of pertinent verse. Which, all right, cool. Uh, in 1943, she exhibited her work along with another artist by the name of Sienna Miller. Um, her work during this period was covered in a PIX, P-I-X, magazine article. And she described how her paintings were psychic experiments which drew heavily on her unconscious. She said that a lot of times she would go into like a trance-like state when she was painting. Okay. I also got the idea that maybe she got these ideas in her dreams, but that was She her. was ahead of the psychedelic revolution? <laughs> she really was. She was the beginning of it, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was at Pertinent, that Free Thinking magazine, that she met a younger man named by the name of Gavin Greenless. Um, Gavin Greenless had grown up in a middle-class family. He had developed an early interest in surrealism, and he had become a relatively successful poet, having his work published in newspapers called, as such as ABC Weekly and Australia Monthly. Okay. So sounds pretty reputable. Um, and by the by, mid-1949, the two had become good friends. They also hitchhiked together in Melbourne. It's a thing. Uh, they were, yeah, just not a big deal. Like, you don't have a car. Let's just hitchhike. We won't get murdered for another 20 years. I guess. <laughs> they were searching for a venue where Norton could hold an exhibition for her art. Um, they settled on the University of Melbourne's Roden White Library, where 46 of her paintings, including... Wow. Timeless World, Merlin, Lucifer, and The Initiate were put on public exhibition. However, this did not go well. No, <laughs> no. Only two days after it had opened, police officers surveyed the gallery and removed four paintings. Uh, one called The Witch's Sabbath, Lucifer, Triumph, and one called Individuation. They deemed them as obscene. That was so fast. Yeah, no, bitches. Two days. And this was the late 1940s. Norton was subsequent, subsequently charged under the Police Offenses Act of 1928. Basically, they could just charge you with anything. You offended, you were, yeah, no, absolutely so not. Basically, they had a they had a law that said you pissed a cop off, criminal. Essentially, for oh, obscenity, shit. you were being obscene. So, uh, you know, this is unacceptable. Um, so I, at a court case, she was defended by a attorney by the name of A.L. Abrams, and he argued that the images in a recently published The History of Sexual Magic book had gone through. Like, so the Australian censors permitted that, and he claimed, well, these were far more obscene than what she painted. So basically, mm -hmm. you know, here's some really gross stuff in their eyes not actually gross but here this is super obscene and you printed it so comparatively speaking she's not that obscene and mm -hmm. fuck off you uptight uptight narcs go away yeah she did win that case hey i was, was expecting awarded, that she was awarded a top a whopping four pounds oh in compensation <laughs> which don't think that makes up for the four paintings that they confiscated and then destroyed, but yeah, they I still had like to even, pay her four pounds. Even if you try to convert that and account for inflation and exchange rates and whatever, I still feel like that's an insulting amount. Oh, it absolutely is. It, at the time, I did not account for inflation, but at the time it comes out to about $4.65-ish cents. <laughs> but I would just be like, bitches, write it on a check. I want you to fill out a check for this. Give me a big on check. That. Give me the big one they give the golfers. Yeah. <laughs> but she won. So yay that. There's that. Um, with the legal house hassle in Melbourne over, Norton and Greenless, who had become lovers, which I take a slight caveat to that, only because in the documentary they specified that Greenlees was gay. 
And that's why he and Norton became such besties, like became so close because they were both considered outcasts because at the time homosexuality was illegal. Um, so they were more kindred spirits than lovers, but it seems that she had a thing about having sex with gay men specifying, I like to be involved when I can. I don't know, but go okay. her. If everybody's consenting, who cares? Yeah, I mean, okay, I guess teach their own. I mean, yeah. she's definitely got her own drum, so why yes, not? Absolutely. She is banging the bitch out of that. I was going to say, um, so let her beat it, but then, yeah. It, it doesn't matter. No, no matter which way we go, it's, it's going down. And that's fine. Yeah. Um, so they moved in together to a house at 179 Broham Street. This is in the area known as King's Cross. Okay. And this was known at the time for being a red light district and for oh. people living bohemian lifestyles. So particularly artists, writers, poets, all of that stuff. Okay. Um, Norton associated with many of the locals. There was someone by the name of Dolce Dreamer, who was known as the Queen of Bohemia. She wrote a book of poetry called The Silver Branch, and that okay. included one of Norton's pictures. Oh. Um, several of the local cafes in the area, such as the Arabian, the Apollyon, and the Cashmere, displayed some of her artwork, and she became a relatively well-known figure in the King's Cross artist scene. Okay. Um, so increasingly many visitors came to see Norton and Greenlee set their home. Um, she had decorated it with many of her own occult murals. And this is my favorite because I want one now. There was a placard on the door stating, welcome to the house of ghosts, goblins, werewolves, vampires, witches, wizards, and poltergeists. I'm going to guess the Jehovah's Witnesses never stopped by. I mean, they probably didn't, but also can I skip the poltergeist at least? I know. I was like, mm, maybe we'll take off the poltergeist. Cause I mean like ghosts and we've got that fine, but the poltergeist, they're generally not happy people. I'm not super excited about the werewolves either, if I'm honest, but then we've got Oz who, yeah, you know, yeah, we'll just move with it. Yeah. Um, so the couple was widely seen as the local eccentrics. Duh. Um, they even befriended several sympathetic police officers. So that's nice. Mm -hmm. Although, unfortunately, many on the police force disapproved of their activities and they were constantly searching for criminal charges that they could be leveled at them. Uh, right. In September 1951, they arrested Norton and Greenlease, accusing them of vagrancy, which at the time was an accusation that could be leveled at anyone without a steady job or whether or not they were actually committing vagrancy. What? Right. That's egregious. It is. Absolutely. Um, so. A publisher by the name of Walter Glover came to their aid. He offered them employment as his assistants. After seeing examples of the pair's work, he decided to publish a book containing a combination of Norton's artwork and Greenlease's poetry. Um, and this result was called The Art of Rosaline Norton, published in 1952, which I freaking found and I ordered it. It is a bookshop in Maine I ordered Whoa. it from. Because it's been out of print. They, the original 1952, they only printed a thousand of them. Well, they wanted to print a thousand of them, but they were like bougie as hell. And they wanted to do <laughs> a leather bound, red leather, gold blocking illustrated. And then they also wanted to do a cloth round. Um, and that's really expensive. So they didn't actually get a chance to do the 1000. Um, this work was banned in New South Wales on the grounds of obscenity. It was also way too expensive to print and wasn't bringing in the money to justify the printing costs. Gotcha. So they, yeah. they stopped. As of right now, um, copies numbered up to 505 are known to exist. And you got That's one? Well, not the fancy ones because they did do a oh. reprint in just oh. a regular uh, book form in 1982. That's the copy I got. Okay, okay, I'm okay, sure okay. the copies of these would be just, I wouldn't be able to afford it. I'd have to give a kidney. <laughs> My mind was blown, but okay. I know. A reprint no, makes no, sense. no. Um, <laughs> no, they did a reprint in 1982 in just a regular standard book bound fashion. That's the one that I did get a copy of. Okay. Okay. Um, but I am excited because it, it has black and white and also um, color 
because a lot of her stuff that you find is black and white print because it mm. was printed in, in old photographs or a newspaper. So because they destroyed so much of her work, it's hard to see the actual color on a lot of them. So I was really gotcha. excited that this one was in color. Um, so they forbid, they forbid this from being imported to the U.S. at the time. Um, and after the book's release, Glover was charged by police with the production of an obscene publication. Uh, Norton was called to court to explain her artwork. Um, the judge ruled that two images of the book, the adversary and faux hot, did qualify as being obscene under Australian law, and they had to be removed from all existing copies of the book. So Glover blacked out the two obscene plates in a few copies, but most were unaltered. Okay. So there you go. Um, however, the authorities in the United States were even stricter with customs actively destroying any copies of the book that were imported to their country. Um, the controversy helped gain publicity for Norton, but the charges, the cost of the materials, and then all of the legal fallout <laughs> left Glover bankrupt. So that was kind of sad because he came to their aid and yeah. then in the end, not so good. In 1955, a mentally ill adolescent vagrant named Anna Karina Hoffman swore at a police officer and was subsequently charged. Um, at her trial, she claimed that her life had fallen apart after taking part in a satanic black mass run by Rosaline Norton. Oh, my God. Um, this was, of course, was picked up by, by sensationalist tabloids. Um, Norton disputed this. She does not consider herself to be a Satanist, but a pagan. She denied the claims and Hoffman later admitted that she had made them up. Yeah. When are people going to learn that paganism does not equal Satanism? Not oh, the same thing. Not at all. People freaking suck because the press had published stories accusing her of being a devil worshiper and engaging in animal sacrifice, which she was absolutely against. She found it completely abhorrent and was she was a big pet lover. She had absolutely nothing against animals and was pissed about that so of course with this public outcry the police once more tried to act against her and those who supported her um, in 1955 they successfully took a proprietor of a local restaurant the cashmere to court for displaying some of her works publicly um, the same year the police raided norton and greenlee's home and accused them of performing an unnatural sex act oh for, Evidence for which yeah Evidence for which they had obtained a photograph displaying Greenlee's in ritual garb flagellating Norton's buttocks. It was subsequently revealed that the photos had been taken at Norton's birthday party and then they were stolen by two members of the coven, a dick named Francis Horner and Raymond Auger, who planned to sell it to the newspaper. So basically they stole this roll of film where they were engaging in some BDSM, took some pictures, Maybe they were just doing it for funsies because it was a birthday party. Maybe they were drunk. And he said, you know what? I'm really drunk. Get up there. I'm going to smack you in the butt with a rope. Mm -hmm. Totally bullshit. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this, again, they were in and out of jail for obscenity. Usually charges were dismissed and just continuing on. Um, however, she did get a little bit of more notoriety in a positive light. Because um, a successful English classical music composer and conductor named Sir Eugene Goosens, which can kind of like mess me up because it's Greenlease and Goosens. <laughs> so like we got the G with the double O sound and the E sound. And yeah, so it messed me up for a minute. But he was uh, he had come to Australia and he was like the it guy in the art scene, in the hoity-toity classical art scene. And he was just, he absolutely loved her stuff. Um, he had an interest in the occult. He read a copy of the art of Rosaline Norton and decided to write her himself. Like, hey, I think you're fabulous. We should get together and discuss art and all that stuff. Um, she invited him to meet her and the two along with Gavin Greenlease became friends and lovers. Like. Like a thruple. So like a thr okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, what I was like a thruple. I was like a threesome. That's not the word. <laughs> That's a yes. different thing, but sure. No, yeah, a thruple. So they kind of became a thruple because they were all 
artistic. They were all into the occult and, you know, the mystical arts and all that stuff. And in the documentary, they actually talked about he had uh, discussed wanting to conduct a symphony with her art as the backdrop and a reading of for a few of Greenlease's poems throughout. Um, mm. I don't think this ever became a thing, but I so wish it could have been because I so would want to be there. It would be glorious. <laughs> but as far as I know, I don't think it ever actually happened. Yeah. Um, so this is a super important dude in the Sydney art scene, and he could have really elevated her more to the higher artistic scene and less of just the eclectic bohemian artists. Mm -hmm. um, however, unfortunately, remember we're in the 1940s and 1950s. In 1956, Goosens was arrested for attempting to bring 800 erotic photographs, some films, and ritual masks into Australia from London. Okay. He was charged under that uh, section 233 of the Customs Act, again with the obscenity bullshit. Um, and in court, he had to plead guilty to bringing blasphemous, indecent, or obscene works into the country. He was fined $100. I didn't do the inflation, but obviously it wasn't a large amount. But at that point, the damage to his reputation had been done. Mm -hmm. um, he had to resign his well he chose to resign his position at both the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and the New South Wales Conser Conserv Conservatorium yeah, okay. of Music um, so then he returned to Britain his international career basically ended in disgrace because people are prudes and they suck yeah um, and obviously when that happened the thruple was no more because you that know he did sucks. move back to England um, although in the documentary a friend of Rowie's mm -hmm. was saying how he didn't blame her he did not blame her for any of this even though he had kind of taken a gamble with being with her in Greenleaf I mean like he was the one that unfortunately got caught I say got caught but he was bringing art from home yeah but whatever they were erotic photographs. It wasn't anything that we would consider obscene. There was no no children, no animals, nothing of that involved. It just, again, 1950s. Super uptight. They saw more than an ankle and lost their shit. <laughs> so, okay, maybe not 1950s with the ankle. Yeah. They saw an upper thigh. There you go. But anyway, um, so soon after that, the life that Norton had held with Greenlees was also collapsing. Mm. Um, he was admitted to a hospital in 1955. No. Yes, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia in 1957. Um, Norton continued to visit him and support him through his temporary release in 1964 and afterward. Uh, but Greenlees was readmitted after attempting to kill Norton with a knife during a schizophrenic episode of his. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, he was discharged permanently in 1983, which is approximately four years after her death. Mm. Yeah. That sucks. It does. It absolutely does. Um, tabloid attention surrounding Norton had intensified in the late 1950s. Not shocking, that whole thing with um goosens mm -hmm. and the many times that she was brought in for obscenity charges and having her art confiscated and destroyed um tourists actually came to the area in search of her they were seeking her out um and despite the fact that at the time witchcraft was still illegal in new south wales um and in australia norton openly declared herself a witch mm -hmm. hence the witch of king's cross um, she tried to explain her beliefs to interviewers and in, in emphasizing her faith in like a pantheistic pagan type. Yeah. Um, but of course, they just turned that into witchcraft and demonology and all the stuff that right, right, they right. did. No one was actually listening to her. Right. Um, she was able to sell some of her paintings and she was also using witchcraft to supplement her income by making charms and casting hexes for people. Mm. Um, she later moved into the ground floor apartment in Elizabeth Bay, which is an area of an area of Australia. Uh, she was accompanied by her pets 
and she began to live a more reclusive and private existence, avoiding the immediate attention of previous decades. Yeah. Considering they had never really been that nice to her. I don't blame her. Don't blame her at all. Nope. Um, she was a worshiper of Pan until her death in 1979. She died from colon cancer at the no. Sacred Heart Hospice for the Dying, surrounded by nuns in Christian art. Again, something that one of her friends said she would find sublimely ironic. So yeah. she would have loved it. She would have found it hilariously ironic and not been, you know, feeling repressed or anything like that. Okay. Um, this is one of my favorite things that they said in the documentary, as well as all the research that I found. Uh, shortly before she died, she was reported to have said, I came into the world bravely. I will go out bravely. So she was a super badass bitch until the yeah. end. So, yes, I absolutely adore her. And I am like ashamed I had never, ever, ever heard of her. No. Um, with all the witchy shit that I have done and do with my being obsessed with never heard of her so the fact that I actually got a copy of that book I'm like so excited as soon as I get it we'll just like yes. go through it. like this is amazing but yes I dude you should check out the documentary it's on Amazon it's called the witch of King's Cross she's fabulous and the actress that they have um portraying her in like the reenactments fabulous artistic and beautiful and you get to see these super old like 80s former dancers like she was saying she was a former dancer like she was a go-go girl <laughs> <laughs> she's so beautiful and still fabulous even though she's much older and they're talking about how it's like oh Rowie loved this and Rowie loved that and they just it was it was so good it was beautiful it was adorable um I loved everything about it Okay. But that is what I have on Rosaline Norton or the Witch of King's Cross. This was so fun. It was. It was such a ride. It was. It was, it was consistently her. Yeah. I love it. I feel like I have a good sense now of who she yes. was. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So if you enjoyed the podcast give us a like, share, subscribe on any platform. You can find us on social media. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Our Trivial Obsessions. We're on Twitter at Our Trivial Pod. We have a website, www.ourtrivialobsessions.com. That's where you're going to find our episode references and bonus materials. And you can email us at randomqueensobsess at gmail.com. Random because we are queens because we are obsessed because, because we, we do. do so email us there with any topic requests for a future episode or anything you want to add to the conversation and with that we will see you next week bye <laughs>